Continuing our work with 9.1, confidence intervals on data about proportions, okay? We talked about what the criteria are. Let's grab our calculator. Also, go ahead and grab, if you don't have it yet, your formula chart that we've been using uh, because I want to show you a couple of things uh, in the Chapter 9 section of our formula chart towards the end of this video. Okay, in your calculator, if you are asked to find a confidence interval and you know that the data you are finding a confidence interval of is a proportion, in other words, you know the survey question was a yes or no question. Do you like chocolate chip cookies? Do you watch Friends on TV? Do you like the Dallas Cowboys? You know it's a yes or no question that people were asked. You are dealing with proportions. In your calculator, you will go to the stat menu. You will arrow over to test, okay? So I went to stat and I arrowed over for test. There are a lot of choices in this menu. This menu is what we are going to be using in Chapter 9, Chapter 10, and Chapter 11, okay? But we got to pick the right one. Okay, if you are doing a um, confidence interval about proportions, we are going to pick option A, one prop Z interval. You have to arrow down to option A. Couple of things to be careful of. We are picking one prop Z int, not two prop Z int. There is a difference, okay? We are also not picking option five. Option five says one prop Z test. It is very easy to go, oh, one prop Z, and you don't necessarily notice at the end whether it says test or int, okay? Be careful of that. In chapter 10, when we get to our hypothesis test, we will pick option five for one prop Z test, but we're not doing that right now when we're doing confidence intervals. So make sure you pick option one prop Z int. Int for interval, prop for proportion, and we only had one set of data, okay? On your calculate, I'm sorry, on your formula chart, okay? Again, we're in chapter nine and 10, confidence intervals, and then we'll do the hypothesis testing later, okay? On your chart, it reminds you, hey, are you doing proportion or means? Oh, we're doing proportions. Are we doing a confidence interval or a uh, um, hypothesis test? We're doing a confidence interval. So it reminds you to pick one prop Z int. When we get into chapter 10 and we're doing um, hypothesis test, okay, then we'll pick a different feature in our calculator. Okay, so it's, it's on your chart, but you've got to practice using it so you know which feature to pick. Okay. When you pick one prop Z int, it's going to ask you some questions. It's going to ask you your X, your N, and your C level. C level stands for confidence level, okay? All right, so X is, remember, how many people were in whatever category you set. How many people watch Friends? How many people like chocolate chip cookies, etc. okay? Your N is how many people were in the survey, okay? Um, and then your confidence level will be given to you how confident do you want to be. Typically, it will be 0 0.9, 0 0.95, or 0.99 uh, there, okay? So let's try an example. In a recent survey of 700 community college students, 481 indicated that they have read a book for personal enjoyment during the school year, okay? So uh, they ask us to identify some things, okay? Uh, we'll worry about the NP hat, Q hat in just a minute. X, okay, well, our X is going to be 481, and our N will be 700. And the reason for that is we had 700 total people in our survey, and out of those 700, 481 indicated that they read a book for personal enjoyment. In other words, they read a book for fun. So 481 is our X number. Okay, so I'm going to type in 481 is my X. My N is 700, okay? Now, uh, they have not told us yet how confident we want to be, so I'm not, I can't you know, type that into my calculator just yet. But they specifically ask us if this N, P hat, Q hat is greater than or equal to 10. Remember, we need to figure out if this is going to be bell-shaped because if it is, then we're able to carry on and do our, our uh, confidence interval work, okay? All right, so... Well, what is p hat? Well, remember, p hat comes from x over n. So in our case, 481 
over 700. All right, so I'm going to exit out of my confidence interval stuff. I'm just going to calculate this for a second. 481 out of 700 is 0.687. So approximately 68, 69% of the college students said they read a book for personal enjoyment. Okay, well, what is Q hat? Well, Q hat is the opposite. So 1 minus that 0.687 which is 0.313. Okay, so how will I get N hat P, or NPQ, remember N was 700. So if I multiply my 700 for N times P hat, P hat was 0.687 times Q hat, Q hat is the 0.313, I get 150 point whatever. So N P hat Q hat is 150.5. That is definitely more than 10. So this is definitely bell shaped. And yes, it definitely is appropriate for us to continue on and use our um, confidence interval work. Okay. Generally, most questions are not going to ask you to verify that this N P hat Q hat is greater than or equal to 10. I just wanted to show you, yeah, we, we technically should be checking that every time. Most of the time we're not going to do it, okay? All right, point A, what was the point estimate? Remember, point estimate, if we're working with proportions, is your P hat. That would be the number in the middle of your interval. Ours, we already did it by hand or with our calculator, was 0.687, okay? That means, you know, 68.7% of the students read a book for personal enjoyment. Now keep in mind that 68.7% in our sample, that does not mean 68.7% of all college students read a book for, for personal enjoyment. That's just in our sample. Now if we've done a good job of identifying the people in our sample, should this P hat number from our sample be pretty close to the proportion number for all college students? Yes. Okay, but it's probably not going to be exactly the same, so we're going to build a confidence interval to make a better prediction. So they want a 95% confidence interval estimate of the proportion of all community college students who read a book for personal enjoyment. So remember, we go to stat, test, option A, which says one prop Z int. We say, okay, 481 was our X out of 700 for N, and they told us to use a 95% confidence interval, so 0.95. Okay, the display on my calculator says 0 0.6528 to 0.72149, okay? And they didn't tell us what to round to, so I'll just put all four decimals as fine. 0.7215. I'm going to round that one to four decimals. Okay. All right. That's our confidence interval. Now notice, I already found p hat. I did that kind of by hand a while ago, but my calculator gives it to me anyway. So from here on out, instead of finding p hat by hand by typing in my x, my n, and dividing it in the decimal myself, I'm just going to type it into one prop z n and let p hat come out with my confidence interval. So I'm going to make a note that those two things come out at the same time in the calculator. Saves me from having to do that work. Okay. Now, they want a sentence to interpret the interval. Remember, our sentence will always follow that little format of the previous page on our notes. Okay. I am, or we are, if you, know, if you want to say it that way because we're working as a team or whatever, that's fine. I am 95% confident okay, that the true proportion of blank, and we'll fill in that blank, is between blank and blank. Okay, I am 95% confident that the true proportion of what? What did they ask me to find? Community college students who read a book for personal enjoyment. Okay, that the true proportion of community college students who read a book for personal enjoyment is 
is between blank and blank, whatever numbers they gave me, is between 0.6528 and 0.7215. Okay. Now, change colors here for just a second. What I would point out, just from an interpretation standpoint, my survey results said about 68.7%. That's you know, This is a decimal, 0.687, but in percent, it'd be 68.7. 68.7% read a book for fun. But that doesn't guarantee that the whole population had that same percent. Could have been a little lower, could have been a little higher. So it could have been as low as 0.6528, or as high as 0.7215. Somewhere in there is probably the true proportion. Now, I guarantee I am not 95% confident that the true um, percentage of people read it is in there. Okay, that is not what a confidence interval means. Okay, I am 95% confident that the true proportion is between those two numbers. Okay, all right. Um, they don't ask us this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. What is the margin of error? Well, how far is it from our p hat, our point estimate, to each of these endpoints? Okay, so I'm going to do some subtraction. 0 0.687 minus 0 0.6528 is 0 0.0342. And then the other one, 0 0.7215 minus 0 0.687 is 0 0.0345. Now, these should be the same the reason they're not is because of rounding. Remember how I rounded that one off while ago? But 0 0.034, the first three digits, they are the same. Okay? But so that would be our margin of error. Our margin of error is about 0 0.034. Okay? Um, and again, they should be the same. The reason they're not is because I had, had to do some rounding there. Okay? Um, another way that I could have gotten my margin of error is to average the two, the two uh, values here in my uh, confidence interval. So 0 0.6528 plus 0 0.7215 divided by 2. I'm going to average those together. And I'm sorry, that's not my margin for error. That's my point estimate, my number in the middle, 0.687. Okay. So if you were ever given a confidence interval, you could find the point estimate in the middle by averaging those two together. Okay. Um, but your margin of error, you'd have to do the subtraction to see uh, how far it was from the middle to each endpoint. Okay? All right, uh, another example here. A survey of 80 car accidents in Collin County showed that 46 were alcohol related. <coughs> so 46 out of the 80 car accidents were alcohol related. Construct a 90% confidence interval estimate of the true proportion of alcohol related accidents in Collin County and write a sentence to interpret it. Okay. Well, um, this is about proportion. What proportion were alcohol related? So stat, test, option A for one prop Z int. Our X value in this case is 46 and the N is 80. 46 out of 80 were alcohol related. They wanted a 90% confidence, so our C level will be 0.9. Confidence interval is 0 0.48409. And again, you might have to round it, depending on what the question says, up to 0 0.66591. Okay, that's our confidence interval. Notice it gives us the p hat, okay, the proportion. This is from the sample. From our sample, 46 out of 80. Well, 46 out of 80 is 0.575, which is what they ask us at the bottom. Point estimate. Okay, so our point estimate, which is p hat, is 0.575. And we'll come back in a minute and we'll do our margin of error. Okay? All right. How do we interpret this? Well, remember this is our, our sentence for confidence intervals always starts out. We are, in this case, 90% confident that the true proportion...
of all, uh, I'm sorry, the proportion of all accidents in Collin County that are alcohol related. is between 0 0.48409 and 0 0.66591, okay? All right. Our point estimate, that's the number in the middle. They gave us that, and now they want the margin of error. Remember the margin of error, okay? Our point estimate was 0.575. The low end of our confidence interval was 0 0.48409. The high end... 0.66591. So my margin of error is this distance. It should be the same for either one. Okay. 0.66591 minus 0.575 is 0 0.09091. If I did it the other direction, 0 0.575 minus 0 0.48409, I get 0 0.09091. These are exactly the same. And I figured they would be because I didn't do any rounding. Since I used the full values right here, I knew I should get exactly the same here. On the previous example, I had rounded, so that caused a little difference. So our margin for error is 0 0.09091. Okay? All right. So approximately 58% of the accidents in our sample were alcohol-related. We are 90% confident that the true proportion of all accidents that are alcohol related is between 48% and 67%. Okay, that's kind of what that interpretation is. Okay, critical values, and this is what I wanted to point out to you on your chart right here. When we are working with bell curves, normal populations, normal distributions, okay. Let's say uh, that we are 90% confident. Okay. What's really happening there is we have a normal distribution where 90% are in the middle. Okay. We are 90% confident that the true population uh, parameter is between this and this, whatever those cutoff numbers were. Okay. I didn't draw the bell curves on here, but we understand that that's kind of what's happening here. Okay. Well, if 90% are in here, then doesn't that mean there's 10% split between the two tails? Specifically, there will be 5% on each tail. And, of course, 5% as a decimal is 0 0.05. So 0 0.05 here, 0.9 in the middle, 0 0.05 here. Now, notice those are areas. I'm using decimal form. Those are areas. Okay. There is a z-score cutoff for each of these, okay? If it's a standard normal distribution, mean of 0, standard deviation of 1, okay, there is a z-score cutoff, okay? If our 90% confidence level is in the middle, then that means there's 10% or 0.1 split between the two tails, when we take that 10% and divide by 2, there's 0 0.05 in each tail. That's where we got those numbers from. The alpha o over 2, alpha divided by 2, is just saying, hey, what's the area of that little tail? Okay. They want the z-scores that correspond to this. Okay, well, how do we do that? Well, back in our last chapter, we would say, okay, that's inverse norm because we know the area. We're looking for the z-score cutoff. The area to the left is 0 0.05, the mean is 0, and the standard deviation is 1. So second bars, inverse norm, area to the left is 0 0.05, mean is 0, standard deviation is 1, and we get negative 1.64. Uh, actually, it would be negative 1.645 if I went to, to three decimals there. What if I did this one on the right? Well, I would do inverse norm. The area to the left of this guy is 0.95 with a mean of 0 and standard deviation of 1. And we get positive 1.645. 
notice, and hopefully you, you notice this as we work through some of those problems in Chapter 7, that if the, it was a middle percent, whether 90%, 70%, 80%, whatever, if it was a middle, then our two tails ended up with the same z-score cutoff, except one was positive, one was negative. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. We are just going to use the z-alpha over 2 of 1.645. Okay, for some problems that are coming up in just a second. Okay, we know that there's the positive and the negative version. We're really just interested in the number part because the formula we're going to use is going to end up squaring it. So whether you put a positive or a negative doesn't really matter because when you square it, it's going to come out positive anyway. So I'm just going to write down the positive number. Okay, if I want it to be 95% confident, notice that my alpha, my, my middle would be 95%, so that's 5% split between the two tails. So that's why alpha is 0.05. Divide that by 2, and you get 0 0.025. I'm just filling in that 0.5 from a while ago. Okay? Okay, well, how do I get the z-score to go with it? Well, when it was uh, 0.05 for my z-score right here, I did inverse norm 0 0.0501. So now I'm going to inverse norm. 0 0.0250 and 1. Basically what's happening is my bell curve, instead of 90% in the middle, I've got 95% in the middle. So this part has gotten wider, which means these tails are going to get a little bit smaller, which means that that z-score should be further out. Okay, and let's see if it is. Second bars, inverse norm, 0.025. 0 and 1 for the mean and standard deviation. And I get negative 1.959. So if I did two decimals, I would get 1.96. I'm just going to put 1.96. Okay. Again, I'm not going to worry about the negative because I know that this z-score would be negative 1.96 and this will be positive 1.96. And the reason they're even asking me about these critical values at all is for a problem that's going to come up in a minute where it won't matter if it's negative because we're going to square anyway. So I'm just focused on the number part. Okay, what if I wanted to be 98% confident? Well, if I have 98% in the middle, that means there's 2% for the tails, 1% in each. So my alpha is 0.02, alpha divided by 2 is 0.01. And my z-score, to get that, I'll do inverse norm. 0.01, mean of 0, standard deviation of 1. And I get, again, I'm going to ignore the negative and just call it 2.33 if I round it to two decimals. What if I wanted to be 99% confident? Well, that just leaves 1% for the tails to share, so alpha is 0.01. Divide that by 2, and you get 0 0.005. So inverse norm, 0 0.005, mean of 0, standard deviation of 1. And our z-score cutoffs will be 2.575. Okay. These values right here in this last column are what we call critical values. They are labeled as critical values or as Z alpha over 2, so the Z score that goes with those alpha over 2 numbers. On your chart, on your formula chart, as long as you are doing 90%, 95%, 98%, or 99% confident, those numbers are given to you. Okay. In fact, uh, a lot of stat students who do this often enough, you kind of have those memorized. Okay. You don't even have to type in your calculator. You might not even need your chart because you've done them so many times that you kind of have them memorized. Okay. However, there is a homework question or two where they will say, hey, what if you're 80% confident? Or what if you're 97% confident? Those are not on this chart. So when they ask you for the critical value that goes with it, you would have to do this process right here to answer that homework question. But most of the time, when we get to our next set of questions here, it's going to be a number that's on this chart. Okay? So you know how to do it if it's not, but most of the time it's on your chart. Okay, who cares? Why do we care about these critical values and doing the inverse norm to get these critical values? Okay, here's why. What's going to happen is 
Let's say that we want to know, hey, what percentage of people are Dallas Cowboys fans? And we can go out and we can survey some people, maybe 100 people that live in our neighborhood or 100 people, you know, that we meet at the mall or whatever. Okay, we can survey some people. But how many people should we survey if we want to reasonably expect our results to be accurate? Okay, so I mean, I could go survey 100 people, but there's no guarantee that the 100 people I pick will give me accurate results about the entire population, okay? Particularly when you're talking about something regional like Dallas Cowboys fans, there's probably a higher percentage in the Dallas area than there is in New York or Florida or somewhere else. So how many people should we survey and from around the nation if we wanted it to be accurate for a nationwide survey, okay? That's what this formula does for us, okay? And it's on your chart as well. Okay, they're right here on your formula chart in the chapter 9 and 10 section. And there are two of them. This one, this top one, is what you use if there has been a prior estimate. So in other words, maybe 10 years ago, a friend of mine did a survey and figured out that 60% of Americans were Dallas Cowboys fans. Well, I have a prior estimate. I have her old survey results, so I can use this formula. But if no one's ever done this survey before, and it's a brand new idea, no one's ever tried it, I don't have a previous estimate, an old formula to use. I'm starting from scratch. In which case, I use this formula. A prior estimate is unavailable. Okay. Now, what's the difference in those formulas? Well, if I have an old estimate, I have an old P hat. My friend's survey said 60% of the people were Dallas Cowboys fans. So I can put 0.6 for P hat. Remember, Q hat will be the, the reverse of it that adds up to 1. So if P is 0 0.6, then Q hat will be 0 0.4. Z alpha over 2 will be those critical value numbers from the table. Hopefully, they're asking me to be either 90, 95, 98, or 99% confident, and I can use these values. If they want to be 97% to be confident, I don't have that value, and I'd have to use inverse norm to get the value to go with it. Okay? E. E is your margin of error. Okay, so how much are they willing to be off by? And you'll plug those numbers into this formula, and out will come the N, the number of people that you need to survey. Notice, if we don't have an old data set to look at, the Z alpha over 2 divided by E squared, that's the same. But instead of P hat, Q hat, they just put 0.25. Because I don't know. I don't have old data to use for P hat, Q hat. So they just picked the number 0.25 to go here. And there's reasons they put 0.25, but that's beyond the scope of what we need. Okay? So if you don't have an old data set, then you would use this formula. Remember, N stands for how many people you should survey. It will probably come out as a decimal. Let's say it came out to 253.8. Can you survey 253.8 people? No, you cannot. Okay? So you can't survey 0.8 people. So this is one of those times where you would always, always, always round up. So I would survey 254 people. Now notice, even if it had been 253.1, I would still be rounding up to 254 because I have to go up to the next person if I wanted to be at least as accurate as whatever they had told me. Okay? All right, so let's try an example of that. A television sports commentator wants to estimate the proportion of Americans who follow professional football. What sample size should be obtained if he wants to be within three percentage points with 95% confidence if, so they're asking us this question twice, once he uses a 2010 estimate of 63% obtained from a Harris poll, or B, if he does not use any prior estimates. Okay, well, first of all, why would we care what percentage or proportion of people follow football? Well, in recent years, the NFL, professional football, has probably taken a little bit of a hit in viewership. How many people watch, how many people follow the games, etc. One is probably the concussion incident, and the other one is probably the um, um, national anthem in, uh, controversy or incident. So um, those two reasons, I can guarantee you the NFL people are interested in what proportion of people are following football, okay? So they want to know, hey, what, per what percent of people are watching our games? Because that's going to affect how much we can charge for advertising and all sorts of things, okay? So we need to know what sample size should be obtained. How many people do we need to survey? We need to find N. 
He wants to be within three percentage points. That's our E. Okay, 0.03 with 95% confidence. All right, so our formula, if he uses a 2010 estimate for 63%. So in 2010, someone did a survey and said, oh, 63% of the people like it. That's a P hat. 63% was the proportion who liked it in 2010. Well, if P hat is 0.63, we know Q hat, don't we? We have an old estimate, so this is our formula right here. Q hat will be 1 minus 0.63, which is 0.37. That's our Q hat. So our formula right here, we have a prior estimate. N equals P hat, Q hat, times Z alpha over 2 divided by E squared. Okay, well, P hat was 0 0.63. 63% of the people were fans in 2010. Q hat is 0 0.37, because P hat and Q hat add up to 1. Z alpha over 2. Well, they mentioned they wanted us to be 95% confident. Our chart right here says that if we're 95% confident, our critical value Z alpha over 2 is 1.96. So we're going to use 1.96. Now, if they had not used a number that was on our chart, let's say it had been 94% confident, then we would have had to go back to an inverse norm with the 94%. Follow that process in order to get our Z alpha over 2 number. Okay? But they told us what it was. Okay. Divided by E, well, E was our margin of error. They said within three percentage points, so 0 0.03 squared. And I'm going to type that in my calculator. I'm going to go ahead and put 0 0.63 in parentheses, 0 0.37 in parentheses, and then another set of parentheses around 1.96 divided by 0 0.03. So notice my 1.96 divided by 0 0.03 is in parentheses raised to the second. And out comes 994.97, okay? Now, we cannot survey 994.97 people, okay? We always, always, always round up, so we will survey 995 people. I would point out, even if this had been 994.1, I would still be rounding up to 995. Okay, because if you round down, okay, you would lose a little bit of accuracy. You would not be 95% confident anymore with a 0.03 margin of error. Okay, all right, and the last part, what if he does not use any prior estimates? So in other words, he says, you know, that 2010 survey they did, they had some problems. They didn't pick a good amount of people. I don't really believe that that 63% was accurate. I think they messed it up, so I don't want to use that. Okay, fine, don't use that. Then you would use this formula right here, 0.25 times your Z alpha over 2 number divided by your margin of error squared. So that's our formula if we don't use an old estimate. Our Z alpha over 2 is still based on that 95% confidence margin of error 3%, so it's still 1.96 divided by 0 0.03 squared. That's still, these values didn't change. So 0 0.25 times 1.96 over 0 0.03 to the second. 1067.1. And again, this is our N, our number of people that we need to survey. We always round up. So we will survey 1,068 people. Okay. If you only surveyed 1,067, you would not be 95% confident with only 0.03 margin of error. So that's why we always have to round up. Okay.